industry into biomechanics, you know, with, you know, we, we've spoken about it as natural patterns and understanding of the way the body moves. A lot of us coaches, you know, a lot of the guys on here, coaches are, are seeing it show up here and there. David Weck, Naudi Aguilar, all of this sort of um, understanding of fascial anatomy and the way the body naturally moves, primarily based around gait mechanics. And what part does that have to play in the fitness industry? It's like getting strong, getting explosive, like that, that's a hell of important. And we understand that that leads to improved athletic performance. But what role does this like biomechanics side of things have to play in performance and in longevity? And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's worth a look for everyone. And it's, um, you know, I think the fitness industry and coaches are figuring it out behind the scenes. And very soon it's going to, you know, there are guys already coming up with answers, but very soon, you know, there's going to be this evolution of it into sports performance institutes, into academies. I really, really believe that as we make sense of it, right? You know, you've looked into it quite a bit already, Keegan. You know, it's just like the one big thing was the lack of measurable results, right? And, uh, you know, what we're, what we're not seeing is, is a system that, you know, I, identifies this progression. Okay, as you learn to, you know, mobilize and use your spinal engine, as you get your feet straight, your hips back, it's just like, what positives do we see for an athlete? Um, and a lot of the systems aren't really able to do that. They're just, you know, subjectively, everyone's saying, oh, I feel amazing. I can, I, I, I'm running faster. I'm this, I'm that. Um, but an actual system of analysis where we're looking at the posture and position and a standard way of analyzing movement, I think is really going to help us to see how these biomechanics practices actually show up and improve our, improve our performance, improve our alignment, improve our movement. So, you know, that's some of what I've been working on and, you know, contemplating how we're going to, you know, actually pitch this to the guys who yep. want to improve their sports, improve their performance. Cause the everyday people are just getting on board with it. They love it. They're like, shit, I feel great. My knee doesn't hurt. Let's go. Um, but the, the athletes are harder to convince, especially the guys who have been working hard in the opposite direction, not the opposite direction. You know, you improve your explosiveness and your power through clean swing snatches. Um, that's amazing. You've improved your performance, but is there, was there a risk to that training when you look at your biomechanics? Is there, is there a risk? So yeah, it's just been um, fun diving into it. Yeah. I, th I think this is a great conversation that needs to be had. Uh, there's sort of these two worlds of thought about training and, and thinking like, are they opposing? Are they complementary? You know, mm. where, what, what is the future of training going to look like? And you have people at one extreme who are like, everything is patterns. Yeah. You don't need to worry about physics, force. You just need to worry about getting the pattern right. And then you're going to be able to, everything's going to be magically fantastic. You're going to go and break right. the shot put world record and the 100 meters world record and, yeah. and everything because you, you put it in the perfect pattern. And then at the other extreme, you have... Well, powerlifters and weightlifters are the people who can lift the most weight and the people who can lift the most weight fastest. And therefore, if we bring those traits into what we're doing, then then we'll be the, the best athletes. And I think the conversation to be had is, well, obviously there's something here that that's valuable because you can see that uh, animals in nature do move differently. And we are in these modern environments where we're not, you know, we're wearing shoes and we're sitting down so much and all of these sort of postural, like we can see that something's going on, something's changing with the human body. Mm. Yeah. But then there's this other side of, well, try, try not lifting weights and see what happens. See how many, you know, see how your rugby team goes, see how many world records you, you break in the, you know, in the shop hood. So to me, the, the, the thing is, the question is, and, and one of the great things I think we can have with Uncommon Success is, well, let's let's have a forum around this. Let's let's discuss you know, where the wins are, where the learnings are, um, you know, how much of this do we want to take on? Where does it fit? And and you've got a great background to, to lead this conversation, Brian, because you've done really well in, in CrossFit. You've pushed hard with CrossFit. I think you had the rugby background. Is that correct? Um, yeah, water polo rugby. Um, yeah. And so, so, you know, you've been, you've been that guy, heavy, 
you've worked hard in the gym. Like you're a big, strong South African. That the the the, uh, <laughs> the stereotype of a of a South African giant like Luke Carter and uh, you know Daniel <laughs> Daniel's doing all right as well. But um, but yeah, like that. So you you have those you have these extremes. Where where does it fit? Do we need to go to war with each other? Like, is it a showdown or are they actually? Um, things that can be run complementary, like that's that's probably oh. where I see it going. But let, let's have mm. the let's have the conversation of what what needs to go and and what needs to stay and who needs what when. So mm. who who needs this most? Who needs natural patterns most? You can say yeah, it's for everyone all the time, but like who who are the people who are like now they these people definitely really need it. Ex athletes, one hundred percent. I mean, for for example, me. You know, I you know they. The guys who have gone there, they were the athlete at school. Um, and maybe when they first started youngster, let's talk primary school, they were bouncy. They were athletic. They could jump off the roof. They could step. They could cut and turn. All they knew was like the sensation in their hands, the sensation in their feet, the balance of their head. And they could just, whatever the, whatever they needed to do, they were animalistic. Their shoulders flowed and moved. And then it was like, okay, how do I level up? Because I got some potential, right? So, okay, I've got to hit the gym. All right, let's go. Let's deadlift. Let's back squat. Let's bench. Let's do I pull ups? Oh man, I love this gym stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to do it more and more and more. And then they stiffen up a bit. The shoulders don't flow and move as much. They go apply that to the field. Bam. You know, Oh, it torn, torn my ACL. Like, man, my shoulders don't feel that good throwing a water polo ball anymore. Great. I've got these big pecs and shoulders and, you know, um, but why can't I throw as well? And they, they go and they try to apply their strength into their sport, but now their nervous system has completely changed. It's not this fluid, bouncy kid anymore. It's now a little more stiff, a little more rigid. We also saw those like bodybuilder types who showed up in rugby, for example, and they just, man, they just couldn't get right, right? They couldn't stay injury-free. Is, Pocock, is it Pocock, David Pocock, right? massive yep. right he had all this strength all this power could back squat deadlift he just like his inputs in the gym overtook his inputs in his like fluidity his cutting and turning so that like those knees just went the back went the shoulder went i don't know specifics of his injuries i know the knee was a big one um but you know there's so many guys like that that they just lost their sport that got them into physical training and then they, they couldn't get it back. So, you know, what they committed to eventually was like, okay, I'm just going to keep just gymming because it's a one thing if I stay in these sort of safe, secure, um, you know, not spontaneous patterns, you know, uh, great. I, I can at least see my back squats, my cleans, my swings, my snatches go up. Um, but that's now, there's a negative return eventually. And the negative return comes when those nervous system inputs of the gym now overtake your fluid inputs. I know the ATG system loves the idea that, hey, you've got to keep playing your sport to see this, the, the gains in this um, you know, work you're doing outside the gym, right? This force output you, you're, you're creating and you're developing. And I, I think what the beauty of that, the guys who have kept paying, playing their sports, like the nervous system, the fluidity, inputs have been higher than what they were doing in the gym like for example michael jordan like you know he, he didn't hit the gym much but when he did those inputs weren't enough to overtake his basketball because he was playing basketball four five six hours a day so the fluid patterns that he had that movement of the spine um you know those hips back the long open belly and the chest he just flowed he didn't get the compression and the tension that shows up when the gym becomes everything where we get we get compressed we learn to hold tension Locking in certain in muscles into water right <laughs> I don't know. i'm um, looking for yeah. a um i'm looking for a video i was looking for a video of uh joseph manu who's an athlete that i worked with joseph, joseph manu his, he was dancing after the uh it was it was when he was playing for new zealand he was he was dancing he's a, he's actually a great dancer i think he danced at his own wedding maybe it's maybe it's there on his youtube at his, at his wedding right um yeah. very creative young man very yeah he's uh very religious uh island background and he's he's a phenomenal dancer uh and he's you know he's mm. big and he's strong and he's been playing and and uh and he moves very fluidly and and i think I had that experience with 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 a lot of athletes because there's a lot of Polynesian background athletes uh, in in Australia 
or uh, Maori influence as well, and they have more more of a mm. culture of dancing, and mm. it does tend to lead towards more fluidity of movement. Um, but they, Absolutely. you know, they also they also get the work done in the gym. So I, I think it's the mm. question of like, I the- think when it gets to that point of like, it's you know when it's all or nothing, or when something has to be completely removed, it gets a bit wacky. And you know, there's the, the extreme of this message, Brian is. Um, you know, football enhanced who came and spent some time with me here in Montenegro. And we, you know, we played soccer here in the, in the gym and uh, he came and hung out for a week, stayed with me. We had a great time. His message is soccer players getting in the gym. is going to destroy your career. You're never going to make it as a pro. You should mm. never go to the gym. And, you know, he does strength training for the, for the feet. And it's based on, yeah, you know, it's connected with the, the uh, level system that's out of Lebanon that uh, Haaland is is using, the, you know, arguably the best player in the world at the moment. Um, right. Alex Alex Lobos is, works with with that system as well. There's it's the level system, seven levels, something I think it is. Um, that yeah. So he's having the conversation of like, if you go to the gym, you won't make it as a pro. Like he, that mm. that's his message, and mm. I to me it's it's like. It's gone. It's it's going too far. Uh, when you say yeah. that, if if an athlete's naturally really fast, mm. then it's you know it can it can happen. It could happen that an athlete becomes a great pro without going to the gym, especially in soccer where there's a super high skill component. And if you can avoid injury, but once you have an injury or if you're not fast enough, I was just too slow and too weak, Brian. Like mm. maybe maybe it was my patterns. Maybe my patterns were already broken. But long before I went to the gym, I was yeah. injured. And and the uh, hockey is naturally like not such a natural pattern. You're playing bent over, you're playing lopsided, you're only swinging mm. one way, um, and you're hunched forward a lot of the time. It breaks a lot of kids' postures just playing the game. Um, yeah. yeah. So for me, like the gym got me upright. It got me fast enough to to be a national level player, and th- there was no chance I was getting to national level. Like I was told over and over at 14, 15, 16, like. No way. Mm. And, and I got mm. to the Australian squad, you know, for, for uh, indoor hockey. And I was unlucky to miss out on the uh, Australian under-21s team. And I got fast because I just put, could put more force into the ground. Mm. Um, I, I think I should – I think some, you know, the natural patterns – because I had shin splints and I had compartment syndrome and I did battle mm. through stuff. But I'd been – I battled from before I did weights. And I was kind of a sickly right. kid. And I just was one who was going to work hard. I was one who was probably going to get overuse injuries. Mm. But – I think if I had some, you know, some of the natural patterns work, it would have been really good for me. Mm. Um, at the same time, I, I, I don't know if, you know, would it have given me the power? Would it have given me the speed to go from being one of the slowest kids to being one of the fastest kids? Yeah. 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 You know, so with that, I think the natural patterns, they, they have to come first, right? Because that force output, you, you learn to drive more force into the ground. Of course, you're going to see that improvement. But as you go from compressed, let's say you've got your toes out, your heels down, your pelvis is slightly tucked, your abdominals and chest are braced, your shoulders are round, you know, it's just like that's someone who's quite dominant through the heels, you know, like they'll, they'll be dominant up and into the quads. They won't have those glutes and hamstrings that, they, that sit back and behind you to drive you forwards, all right? And primarily most, most sports like driving forwards is, in, is important. Um, so if you have those compressed patterns and you now deadlift, back squat, like sure, it'll it'll take you a little further, but on poor foundation. So your risk of injury now I- improves. It's like putting, putting in a bigger engine in a car with one, e- one wheel turned slightly out. It's a misaligned. I-, I think the idea would be mold this body without putting any muscle mass and any more neural stress and intensity in the poor patterns. Like let this body relax and mold into fluidity again, get back down to the floor, get the toes in, the heels out, the hips back decompress through the belly and the chest so that spine can move. And once you have that and you're not holding tension in your body, and we teach you how to take that from the crawl to the walk, to the run, then to agility, then to absorbing force, where when you get hit, you can actually absorb that force correctly. Now add resistance to that. Eat well, get on the ground, get your test levels up and move with intensity. Like, you know, sure, you can get into the gym and train and you're going to do push-ups but you're going to press with a landmine as if it's a throw or a strike you're going to crawl with intensity you're going to push push sleds which is totally against like the hypertrophy model because it's not like you can't progressively overload it but you add intensity to that you sprint you do hill sprints you carry you crawl 
um, you know, sure, it can be more structured, lower body, upper body sessions, but you get those patterns in first, then you add the resistance and the intensity to those patterns without lo losing them. And there's, you can take that further and further and further. And you can just see this person increase their, their intensity um, and, and build a little bit of muscle mass, build a bit of size. It's not the aesthetic look. It's not the pecs and the delts and the abs that, that show up. We don't get that aesthetic look. But this person gets heavier. We see their back, their lats fill out, the glutes, the hamstrings, um, you know, and, and the whole backside get, we, we put on size there much quicker. Uh, and before, you know, we see the biceps, the pecs, the, the quads and the abdominals all, get all jacked up. And that, that's when you see a beast, right? Like you see these guys walk onto the field and I, I wouldn't be scared of a guy who's kind of like walking stiff and compressed like this, right? I'd be worried if I saw a unit who was just like flowing through his shoulders and just didn't care. His hands were at ease and it was just like hips were back and behind him. That, you know, it's just like this guy can take the ball and think of nothing but what he wants to do. And you see that freedom in certain guys. Um, you know, my, my, you know, rugby uh, up to date, I'm not so up to date with the players at the moment, but you know, like, for example, like Jonah Lomu, like he didn't have to think of anything but what was in, in front of him. And he was, you know, not compressed through the front side of body, his body. Everything was driven for back and, from back and behind him. Michael Jordan, for example, you go watch videos of the guy play and he was just like a rubber band until he needed that tension and intensity to move straight up. You go watch Tom Brady, all right? He doesn't have the size and he didn't really sort of build up, but he's just so loose the way he... He throws and can be so much more accurate and so much more focused and make these quick decisions on the field because he's not holding compression and tension. Guys who have had injuries and you're now always thinking about that, there's a little bit of your, your, you know, your neural awareness and you know, your, your focus and intensity is in that knee. Uh, if you hold a bit more tension in your, your pecs and your biceps and you're connected to these parts of your body because you've been doing some bodybuilding, there's a little bit more of your your, your attention gone, right? You know, instead of just being able to flow through these fascial lines where everything is just your, your one body, and it sounds a little woo woo, but really when you get back into it, you know, and you start to just flow and move, like you feel, I mentioned it earlier, you just know where your hands are. You, you can feel your hands on the ground. If you're crawling, other than that, you're just aware of the balance of your feet and you can look for the ball and where it is. And you start to do things spontaneously again. And you lose that when you hold tension anyway. So the natural patterns needs to come first because then you can just be an animal again, All right? Then you add intensity to that. You're not going to blow up. You're not going to have that size um, that is like it is aesthetic. But, you know, if you increase the resistance of that, you're eating well, you can see guys seriously build with these natural patterns. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question, but if, for me, like the, the patterns have to come first in my lens. Then you can add other gears on top of that. You can go snatch and clean, but as long as when it's time for you to run and at the snap of the fingers, when you run, right, you're, your head's over your foot, right? Your feet are straight, your hips are back, and you're being driven from back and behind you. But a lot of guys, there's so much neural input to, to crank out, like deadlift, clean swing, snatch, back squat. You know, when, as a hip thrusts forward, the femurs rotate out and the pelvis tucks, right? That's what their body knows how to do. So they'll do that on the field. But the opposite is, is kind of not the complete opposite, but, you know, as the hips stay back and behind you and you drive the ground behind you, that femur, the, the upper leg actually r rotates in as, as you drive the ground behind you. Now what happens to my head is I move over to the other side and I'm per perfectly balanced for the next stride forward. But if you've taught yourself to rotate this femur out, everything stays stiff and rigid. And you see how the spine doesn't really want to move. It's, it's here, long glutes back and behind you that, you know, organizes the head and the spine. Now you're perfectly balanced to take that next step. And you're, you've taught your shoulders to flow and move because you've been working the crawl and that's patented into your nervous system. So once you come back to moving this way, it's just less thought and more just, you know, your eyes wide and you, you get this, this animal back, right? And if we can, Get animals again, not guys who are so worried about where their body is in space and tentative. Oh, should I be on my heel or should I be on the outside, inside of my foot? You know, we second guess. We just 
I want to see guys get their childhood back, right? I think initially this conversation is probably going to make a lot of people more tentative, but maybe the end game, it makes mm. them less. Because I, right. I never heard a player worrying about being on the inside or outside of their foot or, you know, they were just running over the guy in front of him. And some, right. of, them duck, yeah, fair. Duck, so, some of them were duck-footed and some of them weren't. Um, gotcha, and, yeah. But but there are definitely those guys that have a lot more injuries. And there's there's a lot to what you're saying here. And yeah, as I, as I said, the question for me is like, how much of this is is skill work that you do on top of your weights to be able to mm. move your body? Like, for example, with the Ido Portal model, with the spinal waves and everything, like to say that the people in Ido Portal system aren't strong would be, would be uh, you know, a disservice to, to what's gone on there. And to say that right. they didn't have yeah. good spinal ability and spinal control would also be pretty difficult to argue. Um does that did they end up becoming great athletes? Like probably not because they they weren't. I mean, in terms of the running and mm-hmm. going and playing sports and stuff, because they weren't really running and you know they did bits of parkour and whatever. And it's a it's a different game. But I would love to you know we've got Maxime here who works with the Chinese uh, Olympic sports and is is thinking deeply on strength training. Uh, we got Giorgo who's who's uh, been an elite power lifter and thinking deeply about his training. Daniel's been doing rope flow and done a lot of CrossFit and he's a South mm-hmm. African compatriot. Uh, David is a deep thinker in general. I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, uh, Brandon, good to see you on there as well. But Brandon's thought a lot about movement and movement patterns as well. Maybe I'll throw to you first, Brandon, because you haven't uh, shared as much on calls and I know you're, you've you probably got something interesting to say here. Epic. I'll mute myself. Can I hit the... Uh, you got a lovely skyline there in the background. Sorry. Yeah, I'm out, uh, out walking the dogs. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, so pretty new to Uncom. I just joined this call, so I don't really know what this call is about. <laughs> um, Maybe so what, are, what are we talking it, about? Is it your? It did, you just joined your brother? Is uh, the Cairo? Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm confusing you with your brother. Sorry. What's your What's your brother's name? Uh, Caleb. Yeah, Caleb. Okay. He's my younger brother, three years younger than me. Just joined uh, and got him signed up yesterday. So he just joined, but yeah, you you're not the chiropractor in. Uh, Arizona. Yeah. Nope. Uh, nope. Pharmacist out in New Mexico. Sorry. <laughs> got my wires crossed. Sorry, brother. It's, it's all um, good, man. Sometimes difficult tracking uh, everyone. I had a conversation in San Diego with, uh, I think his name's Brandon as well. It, it might be Brandon Scott. If it's Brandon Scott, then I'm letting myself off the hook. But um, if it's not Brandon Scott, then I fucked up. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll, we'll, uh, we'll continue the conversation, but yeah, welcome. And, and thanks for jumping in and, uh, what kind of dogs you got there? You show us while you're. Um, yeah, let me turn off my background real quick. Uh, oh yeah, it's doing there. Sorry, I'm on my phone here, so I never really used you. Uh, I got a German. Let me show you. Here. Got a little healer. Little healer. Got a black uh, German Shepherd, and then he's a uh, got a Rottweiler mix. Yeah, it's not it's not uh it's not focusing as well as it should because it's playing around with the, the zoom thing. But no, yeah, good. Enjoy the enjoy the walk. It looks like a beautiful spot. Thanks Appreciate for it. jumping in. We'll speak soon. Who who would like to share their thoughts around this? Is there, has anyone done much of a deep dive on the general I gist have- is yeah, you can. I have a little bit to just uh, kind of chime in on just because I was in my car accident in 2012. Um, I got ejected from a rolling pickup going 75 down the interstate and um, been dealing with a lot of back pain. So like the basic movements, you know, I'm, I'm stiff, I'm compressed, like you talk about in the upper body. Um, like how, how would one get back to like, where would somebody start? getting back to the basics. Can I jump in there, Keith? Yeah, brother. Yeah. Love it. Awesome. So, um, sorry, what's your, what's your name there? I didn't see it show up. <clears throat> Morgan. Morgan. Good to meet you, man. So yeah, you know, the, the typical, um, you know, what, what happens with that back in the, when you've had an injury and you're, your back's protecting itself. We, we stiffen up, right? It doesn't want to side bend. It doesn't want to flow. It doesn't want to move. And, you know, the typical or often at least 
way back, you know, you might go try to get the help of a physiotherapist and the rehab program is all about stabilizing and maybe stiffening up. This is a generalization. There are physios who are very forward thinking and understanding spine movement mechanics. Um, but basically what we need to do is first and foremost, create space and lengthen that spine by getting the hips back and behind you. So if we very simply from a side profile, look at, you know, th this is oversimplified, but you know, where your hips are in relation to your rib cage, if your hips are right below your rib cage, there's compression through your entire spine and often making us very heavy on the heels. When we get the hips back and behind us, now there's the opportunity to open up through the belly and the chest, right? We'll still, we'll hold tension in the musculature of your back, right? But that's, that's what's designed to, to hold that tension. There's a lot of fascia. You think of that like thoracolumbar fascia, which is all that like, you know, you look at the anatomy of the back and you see all this like this white sinew. That's all the, the fascia that holds you open and upright. And it's designed to hold tension. It's designed to hold you upright. So we're actually supposed to have those hips slightly back and behind us, right? I'm just going to unplug it. We're designed to have those hips slightly back and behind us and hold tension on the backside of our body, much like a giraffe, you know, like it's got this long head and all this sinew and tissue, its head weighs like 100 kilograms. It's easier for it to have its head up than it's to actually put its head down because of all this tissue back and behind it. And we have the same, right? We're designed to be loaded back here as babies go on all fours, hips back and behind us, long through the belly, open through the chest. When your hips are in front of you and you're thrust forward, the abs are, and chest are compressed. Now the spine stays very stiff, right? So it doesn't want to side bend move and you think that's protecting you. But we need to get the glutes back and behind you to avoid this compression. This is, you know, compressing that spine, right? And we see extensive upper back rounding, sometimes excessive lower back curvature, sometimes lower back flattening, but it, it's all just compression, right? If we can get the hips back and behind you and build your glutes, get them the, the glutes and the hamstrings engaged, you're going to be more likely to breathe and decompress through the front side of your body. And now the shoulders and that, that do, they can side bend, flow and move. Sure, if, if you've got specific, you know, injuries and um, spinal compressions, herniated discs, of course, it's going to be scary to, to side bend, flow and move. But in time, this is what you need to get ready for, you know, those hips back and behind you, that spine that flows and moves, that, up, that upper back can flow with you. And that's going to allow that, like, that spine to, to heal and do what it's designed to. It's not supposed to be stiff and rigid. Sure, that one time you lift something off the ground to put it on your back and then continue carrying something, like, you know, you've hunted an animal bone, if you want to think ancestrally. But now, you know, we're all obsessed with stiffening the spine because we love the lifts, right? Deadlifts, clean, swing, snatches. It's beneficial to have a stiff, rigid brace spine. But now long-term, as you walk and move, if you keep stiff and rigid, there's so much more compression that takes place. But if you can let go, breathe into the belly, let go of the tension through your abs and your chest, glutes back and behind you, the spine will flow and move. And the, the likelihood of you healing with a decompressed spine is well it's much greater than when that pelvis is stuck those abs are braced and you're compressed you know it'd be good to have a uh, yeah. it'd be good to have a discussion with uh one of the guys from atg is really focused on the back and he's, he's put together a lot of stuff in range as well we should do a whole lower back um you know episode version of this and and uh kind of discuss some of the different approaches and and logic with it but hopefully there's some value there Morgan, um, no, definitely. <clears throat> um, Sorry, I went a little wild there. It's good, it's like we can see your passion for it, and you know, you believe in it, it's changed things for you, and yeah, there's there's value. It's, I think, we all go through this with different things over time, right? Like. It you know I I had a couple of years ago with cryptocurrency like thinking of well you know there's no way this money system is going to keep going like all fiat currencies go to zero and so you go down the rabbit hole and you start and you you start having conversations with people of like yeah you know fiat's about to end and it's super exciting to talk about 
you know, what's coming next and how it's going to work. And um, we see the same stuff in the fitness industry of like, okay, yeah, this is, this is something new. This is something different. This is the the real deal. Like we all need to be in ice bars. We all need to be doing rope flow or we all need to be doing breath work and diaphragm work. And it's all great. It's, and it's like, how big is this rock? How much difference is it going to make? And, and which things can we get rid of in place of this? So it's like, if an athlete says, all right, I'm just going to focus on my breath work and I'm going to be the, the world champion wrestler, you know, like obviously everyone giggles and it's, it's like, well, okay, what are the, what are the things that have to stay non-negotiable has to be there. And then how does it all play together? Can we put the breath work in? Should we do we doing more ice, less ice? Should we do it before? Should we do it after? I think that's the nuance of this conversation. I don't think you're going to have any pushback from this network of this is bullshit. Nobody needs to do this. Um, I think everybody's intrigued, curious, and and wondering where they put it in. And it's like, for me, it's a question of how big is this rock and and where do we where do we put it? What do we, what do we do with it? Um, I'd love to hear some other guys' perspectives around around this. You know, what's working with with athletes? Are you incorporating this way of thinking do you do it through you know the the logic that uh that brian's talking about here or you know what what is the the logic and thoughts someone's got the hand. yeah yeah go for it uh daniel can i oh sorry daniel's just put his hand up sorry i he, you know it's like school you know if he's put his hand up like maybe he just needs to go to the bathroom is it is that the <laughs> daniel do you <laughs> We just <laughs> can I go to the toilet, miss? <laughs> no, no, it's uh, as you know, touch on something like Brian was saying with the like I said, like the rope flow, and uh, I've touched in on a little bit of like the movement pattern stuff or you know, goda and, and wake method and, and diving a little bit into that rabbit hole. Um, and something that I, I, I figured you know, just then going into ATG afterwards and, and some of like the strength conditioning stuff, knowing really what is your intention with your training, like the with a lot of the the goda and 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 WEC method and that kind of movement school of thought, it being very forward momentum, meaning like running and, and gait mechanics. And uh, I can recognize what Brown is saying just with like regards to, to athletes with a lot of that, you know, some of the training that some athletes are doing, getting into that compressive states and stuff like that and how they can utilize, you know, that decompression to make them feel better, to feel like that younger version of themselves. Um, like I imagine if you were a, a sports climber, you know, rock climber or something like that, it wouldn't necessarily be something that, you know, would, um, you know, uh, something that would really help them other than, you know, you know, some of those things. So I think it's like really finding out what is your intention, like what is it that you want to train with and how to implement those things. I mean, I, I love rope flow. I see how it's changed my movement patterns, how it's changed my opening up my spine and then adding in other other things with like say the range training, getting the those those tendons and stuff like really, really strong over time now. And it's finding just like you said, Keegan, finding where where you can add in these little things. And, and and optimize for yourself for your own lifestyle like I, i'm i like surfing and being in the water and and trail running and i've found like how the rope flow and gate mechanics has helped me in certain ways so yeah that was just something i wanted to add in there and it's nice to to have another sapphire on the on the call can i jump in now or do we have somebody else yeah, all right, man. Uh, yeah, so I just uh, I have a, a little bit different um, a background from from most of you guys. So I basically done uh, what Brian was, talk was talking about. I done it. You know, I did a lot of this kind of uh, deadlifts, uh, bench press, um, squats, and I completely agree with Brian that these patterns will uh, destroy your natural pa patterns. So. Uh, I believe that it's so what we need to understand is that we need to find the right ratio for the for the individual and for the goals. So uh, if, for example, for me, I, I did the the the, um, the lifting stuff for a long time. So for me, I really had to take a step back from that and uh, have much more natural movement in my training to be able to uh, create those natural patterns again and be able to perform you know in daily life um so i had to take a big step back and actually not do anything of that and go to body work uh, uh, body weight and uh, crawling and uh, running and all this stuff um but i think if if your goal is to lift heavy for example 
then you need to find the right ratio where you will not destroy your natural patterns and you will be able to uh, lift heavy. So, so, and this would be, uh, and I think the ratio will very much uh, be dependent on what you have done in the past. So if you're coming into it like Brian, like he's been doing this for a long time, he has the natural patterns, he could have less of the natural patterns and more of the, of the, the heavy stuff without destroying his patterns, right? If he wants to be like squat 200 or 250 kilos or something like this. Uh, but he needs to have that natural patterns uh, with a certain frequency and certain amount not to, to, to lose that ability, right? So, so I think it's all about what you've been doing and what your goals are, and you will find the ratio of what you need to do. If you just want to live a healthy life and be strong in everyday life, then only natural patterns will, will do it for you, right? So, so that, that, that would be my view on it. If, but if you only want to be activities of daily living, you probably don't need to obsess on this as well. Like, I think that's something that you were, you, you had a good share on that, Brian. You, you sort of posted of, hey, I don't want to scare people out of going and doing a gym class because, because you're so worried about doing the wrong patterns. And then you stop going to the gym and you just go and eat your ice cream and pizza. Like that's the last thing any of us want to do is like paralyze people to not train at all. And, and to me, it's, I think there are enough things that you can do in the gym that are going to be okay for someone who doesn't necessarily want to be elite. Um, and doesn't mean natural patterns wouldn't be amazing to make them feel good again and dance better and just, you know, a phenomenal solution for, for an everyday person, but they don't necessarily need to be scared of other stuff that, you know, because they love CrossFit and they're doing some CrossFit. So they need to be scared of CrossFit um, because they're going to lose their natural patterns. Like maybe they don't need natural patterns for anything that they're doing. If they're not broken, if they do break and they can't do their CrossFit anymore, then maybe you're the guy. I, I don't know. Like, I, I think we just need to, like, if we can leave some nuance in the, in the conversation, like you're saying of like, well, what do you love? What, what do you, what are your outcomes and, and, you know, where, where are your problems in life? Uh, I think that's a, it's a healthy thing to keep in, in the conversation and to be able to maintain the dialogue even just so it's not a war of like, all right, this is, this is the functional patterns crew and we hate everything barbell and we're the barbell crew and we hate everything, you know, functional patterns and, or, or uh, you know, go to, or all these people are just going to war with everything that's worked for the last hundred years. To me, it's, it's, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't say intelligence. It doesn't, it doesn't actually, you know, add to, to the everyday person when 99% of the population is overweight, obese, or unathletic, you know, what percentage of the population is actually training well? Like we're, we're just talking about what 1% arguing about bullshit while 99% of the population is, is actually listening to the major message, which is be Homer Simpson. And, and, you know, so it's like, why are we hit, sitting here fighting amongst ourselves when there's this 99% to go and have a conversation with that doesn't need to be this conversation um, but this 1%, we should have this conversation and it's important for us because we love this stuff and we want to get that 0.1% to the next level. Um, yeah, lo love that, Keegan. Yeah, I, I completely agree there. And uh, I, I also think that that is, uh, that's, that's the point, you know, all of these things, if they work, they have some value. So why 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 stick to one of them you know you, you should there are all parts of the puzzle so take what you need from everything and learn and try it out and and find what will work you know and and when you have found what will work for you it will probably work for other people as well so you can start helping other people uh, i i'm sorry guys i have to go i just want to jump in a little bit i saw that you were in so have a great day and uh, see you again on the next call all right Appreciate bye guys Thank you, brother. Appreciate you jumping in. Maxim, you, uh, you want to have something to share there and then we'll go back to Brian and then we'll go to uh, Zach. Uh, yeah. Um, I will try to explain good with my English, but if with the movement and the pattern of movement, we want to have a structural balance, maybe we just focus on the output and not the input, just to modify um, uh, a posture 
uh, only with the movement and to work only on the fascia or only on the muscles cannot work because the guy have not a good convergence. He has one high coming in the other side than the other. He have he doesn't have a good mechanics of the mandibule. Maybe he have the the tooth forward to the other, so he have the shoulder like this, or maybe the foot are not good. So if you don't um, influence the the first out uh, the first input, maybe you cannot change the output all of the life of the guy who are squatting with a shift of the one side don't come be because he has a uh, he has not a good structural balance maybe he just come to the brain because the brain give the information to the muscles so of course we don't have just one way to 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 tend uh, until the best structure but maybe for the the input to go um, to the output just uh, that my my point of view i th i think uh it would be good to have this conversation in french as well with with fabian and some some other guys uh and we sh we should definitely do some of them there are definitely more factors, you know, and there's, there's always, you'll have that person who tells you, yeah, everything's about the eyes and we need to, we need to focus everything on the eyes or everything's about the jaw position. And uh, yeah, that it comes back to me to like the size of the rock. Okay. Well, if their eyes are almost good enough, you know, does that mean uh, what's going to make the most difference if the athlete has to win um, my, you know, my question would be, Brian, if you go into, if you go into a pro rugby team and you know your your wife is pregnant and you've you've got a one year contract what do you do you know do you go in and say hey no weights guys we we're, we're just going to we you know we're going to work on the natural patterns and we're going to go crush it do you, mm. do you like would you bet would you bet your family on this is going to work better than keeping some traditional components of of strength training well you know that that strength training that force output you know on top of a base of natural patterns have to be there. I mean, the, the rugby team that you see likely nine out of 10, just to get there, they've got some sort of fluidity and flow because it, it, it's, it's a forward moving sport. These are athletes, you know, they, they likely had a good childhood where they were active. So they've retained some of these natural patterns. Um, but I, I would say, you know, um, what Giorgio was saying there, it's just like, you know, it, it's how far do you dive down the lifting and, you know, how much to keep your natural patterns, like how cautious do you need to be? You know, th that's going to vary for everyone based on their goals. But I just really think that there needs to be this base, no matter what, it's all going to be an individual, what we want to build on top of this base, but that base needs to be a certain level of alignment. For example, like if you can't sit in says a sit cross-legged rest um you know in, in a resting squat on the ground there's some sort of misalignment there if you can't when, when you walk if your head doesn't naturally align over your foot like from your side profile if your hips aren't back and behind you you know like th th there's some sort of deficit there that's telling you like hey in the future this could become a problem you know if you've got a whole lot of muscle mass like uh, but your your glutes don't sit back and behind you like half a football it's just like man there's a proportional deficit there that, that's not going to allow you to move well but you know there's there needs to be this base whatever you want to build on top of that whether it's olympic weightlifting whether it, whatever explosive power you need you know for a rugby player for a football player like bench press is going to be important some sort of you know some upper body strength um just as a base Love it. we all need some sort of natural patterns like and that's where i'll end because you know we can go down different rabbit holes that can just go forever right that's it's. I think it's a. I think we're arriving to something really, really good here, and it's like okay, we've got these things that we need to be able to do. You need to be able to sit cross-legged. You need to be able to get into this position, that position. I believe you will be able to get people into those positions who continue to train traditionally, oh, yeah. um, and if they're not injured, they're not broken. Mm -hmm. They they might find hey, do this stuff, pay attention to this, put some of these in. And, and, and you'll feel better. But as uh, Liam's saying there, like, I know I'm broken. I know I'm out of alignment. He's, you know, old, beat up gym owner. 
but mm. I'm not going to stop crossfitting. And Ben Kelly's probably the same as well, you know? And it's yeah. like, are you going to take away the thing that they love when they're not making any money from it? It's not like they don't want to give it up. They want to keep doing it. But could you put them on a path to, hey, you're getting in these positions? To me, that's where millions of dollars are. And I'm going to throw it to Zach because mm. he's our business advisor and we was talking a bit about him before. But I, I think there's a massive opportunity with, with natural patterns. And we, we wouldn't have had, we've had a bunch of conversations about this. It's been probably a year since we started it. And I'm, I'm with you that, this is an important conversation. It needs to be had. The thing is that when it gets to like trashing everything else, which you haven't done a lot of, but most people in that niche have. And I know that it's difficult when you realize like, Hey, I've got something really important and you won't look at it and it's frustrating. But if you say, Hey, this is the only thing you need to look at and you need to stop looking at everything that you've ever believed and everything you've ever loved then to me, you're going to cut a lot of your, your market share, but maybe, maybe it's the opposite because Zach's the, the the business guru here. Like, what are you, and, and he's also, you know, college athlete, super, he's done some big lifting and weightlifting. He's had his share of injuries. Um, what, what are you, uh, what are you picking up in this conversation movement wise or, or business wise, whichever way you want to go with it. So it's really interesting because I think a lot of them are aligned. Like when you, I think two big concepts in this that are both business and athletics is what can we learn from the 1% and scale that back? Um, the truth of that is like some of that is going to be really like the lessons in the fringe are going to be super useful to bring back to what we can do as kind of like people aspiring to get there, uh, but maybe didn't start with like being that gifted. So business-wise, like none of us are Elon Musk. Um, sorry to break that to you if you're on this call. If you were, you'd probably be building a billion dollar thing around your something billion dollar thing. But you can look at how he approaches problem solving and spin that back to your business. Like none of us are LeBron James. We're not built that way. You can look at how he moves and some of the stuff and start to spin it back to like work with athletes. That being said, both of those people have a lot of traits that I would consider to be maladaptive in a lot of people. Like Elon Musk doesn't sleep a lot. Uh, He's on 24 seven and he's kind of like, supposedly just a giant stress ball. I've never met the guy. Um, and I know there are videos of LeBron James circulating around the internet. Like he can barely squat the parallel with like 185 on his back. Uh, his toes look like they were smashed in between like two cars, but like you watch the guy move and it's pretty incredible. So I, I think that figuring out what to take from the fringes and spin back is what we as coaches and we as business owners need to do really well. The second part of that is what Keegan was talking about is identifying where to put your time and resources really important with athletes and businesses. And I think the framework is really similar. So like one of the things we're going through with Uncom right now is breaking the business apart into its core components. So very similar to the natural patterns in the body. So like, how are those things moving? Like, how is the strategy? How are the operations? How is acquisition, retention, referrals all the way through? And then within that, you can identify kind of checks and balances of like, are these working the way it's supposed to? Yes or no. And then we can drill down into that. Same with athletics. Like, can you do these things? Like, where's the bottleneck? And then where do we spend our time and resources? And I think like, those are the kind of the two big things. I think the most relevant is actually the last one is where do you put your focus as a coach, as an athlete, as a business owner? And I think one of the easiest ways to do that, which kind of ties it together is just like, what is the impact versus what is the effort? If there's some really low hanging fruit to where it's going to be highly impactful to the athlete, or highly impactful to tweak your business, and it's like pretty low effort, then you should do that. And I think within the impact, I think he talked about it a little bit of like high, low, medium. High is like, would you bet your family that like this is going to work? Because like, it's a really clear litmus test of whether you should be doing it or not. And I think that confidence interval is going to allow you to say, okay, here's how confident I am. Here's how much effort I think it's going to take. Here are the things that I should naturally bias into to put my time and resources against. Questions, comments, thoughts. You guys can call me an idiot. No, I love that. I mean, I don't know if Keegan's going to jump in. That's what I was waiting for there. But um, yeah, you know, it's it's awesome to, you know, hear you lay out, what, you know, where to put an effort, where that confidence level is. Of course, for me, it's going to be a very, very biased approach. So, you know, I, I don't know whether it's worth me um, sort of... <laughs> you know, putting forth, uh, you know, what I believe on that front or, you know, laying that out. But 
Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's just, you know, I, I, I've got so much passion, excitement and, and belief in, in what this can do for people. And, uh, you know, just giving out and, you know, helping people understand what these, what these patterns are, what, um, you know, the movement practices actually are that are optimal and put us in alignment, you know, like uh, what I do is analyze the posture and position. And we all hear um, or, or see LeBron James. We're like, okay, yeah, he's amazing. But that guy's movement patterns are absolutely flawed and, and we don't see it, right? Like he collapses to the inside edge of his foot um, as he takes up from, from the ground. He's got all this like force production, but you know, his, his body's compromised. Um, so, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. I, with the way my mind works, I, I heard you mention that one thing. I'm just like, boom, like hone in on that. Um, but, you know, like getting people to to understand this and not pitching anyone against each other, like Keegan mentioned before, like the the, the GOTA system had something amazing. And I think like, and, and I think Keegan can saw, like, can see, like, Zach, like I'm asking is just like, have you looked at the go to system and like, what did they do wrong? Because I think that they have like a golden fucking nugget, yeah. but they pitched these people against each other. And, you know, if you have poor movement patterns, they look at you and call you, call you something, they call you something called a woda. And immediately it's just like, you call me a fucking what? And then yeah. like, of course you don't want to be invested in the, in this business model. So, you know, like for me, I, I just understand that like, getting people on board with this message and not not bashing them it, it is hard because there is a beautiful opportunity to show them what is actually causing discomfort and pain um and go to put its business model based around that no i thought that would have been valuable but they, they've like kind of tanked because there's something wrong there but have you looked at their their business model and like why why haven't they taken off so I am, I'll, I'll preface this by saying I'm loosely familiar with Goda uh, and I will give you my breakdown based on that. Um, I think to your point, if I was doing this the right way or the optimal way, it's getting the person to come to the realization by themselves. Right. Nobody likes to get told what to do. I like, especially hate it. Um, yeah. But if you can start to integrate these really small things where the people can like test like on their own, like, hey, can you do this? um if you can't do this like here are some opportunities we may have and like he, like more important than that of like here's what it means for you because i think that we all want to work with the pros but like a lot of the impact of this i think the bigger impact is like what is the impact on gen pop um mm -hmm. people who are in super compromised positions like my wife is a surgeon and i didn't realize until like we were like dating and married of like they're in a really weird position of standing legs locked out doing stuff most of their day yeah. Um, and then you go through enough of that and then the body starts to act up and say like, Hey, this is not cool. Um, so I think if you can talk to people in a way that like, you're saying something that is novel and they're like, Oh, I've never heard of that before. Okay. Let me see how, like, how is this novel thing, um, that Brian is presenting? How does that affect something that I have? We'll just say like back pain is part of that. Um, here's some really weird causes of back pain or like, if you can't do this, like maybe this will lead to back pain. Or if you have back pain, can you do this? Something like that to where right. you're correlating like the system and the output of that they either have or don't have. Right. So I think that like, we can dive deeper into that. I think my brief thing on Goda would be that I do think they have something there. Um, and I think the people I've talked to say that like, they've got some, especially with like the outside edge of the foot um they've got something there what i think they did wrong was i think you need to be a little bit polar when you're getting the idea out but you can't be so polar in the sense that you are trying to go to war with everyone else right yeah and i, I think like as soon as they started like saying everyone else was wrong when like you can look at the data like lebron james high level athlete they're really like they're really good case studies of like as to why the like Yes, maybe this system works and has something there, but like unless it is universally applicable across everyone, then you can't just start calling people like wodas or like shitheads mm -hmm. um, for not being able to adopt the system. I think that's kind of part one. Part two is I think that like anytime you say that like you take what a high level athlete does and say, oh, they would be like X, Y, and Z better if they did this there's a lot of assumption there. I think when you look at the highest level athletes, they are that way because like their body has adapted to move a certain way. 
um, whether it is optimal for long-term health, unsure. Whether it is optimal for the performance of their sport, I think like there's a lot there. Um, back when Deion Sanders was playing at Florida State, I don't know if you're familiar with him, um, probably one of the greatest DBs in the NFL, was also a two-sport professional athlete. Uh, he ran like a 4-2 something his freshman year. And they were like, oh, if we can lengthen, but his hamstrings were mega tight all the time. And they're like, oh, we, if we can lengthen Dion's hamstrings, then he'll run faster. And he actually got slower. So I, I think to kind of wrap that up a little bit, like share the concepts, share why they're useful, but also understand like what is the scope of practice that like you're trying to hit with that and then do so in a way that you're getting people to want to do that rather than just saying like, this is the way. Like when somebody who has never played a professional sport or hasn't coached a lot of professional athletes is saying that like this person would do X, Y, and Z better if they did this, like it's basically conjecture. Um, but if you can do, like if you can position these things in a way that like, yeah, maybe this would help. Or like, here's some things that I see that like this person's doing. Um, what if they did this? Like, could it help possibly? But like, if you're in these positions, like if you can't access these positions, in daily life, the positions that we need to get into, then there's a really good chance to like, maybe not now, maybe down the road, you're going to come up some stuff. So right. I'm gonna pause, pause there, thoughts um, on how you can kind of roll that in. Love that. I'll let someone else jump in, but love that. Zach, I think it also comes down to the like the delivery and then how um how it's delivered right i think of uh i don't know if aaron griffin keegan started with real movement and if anyone knows aaron griffin he's like blowing up on instagram in the last i don't know three six months he does sort of more like animal flow and stuff like that but he makes it fun he makes it like aspiring he's still very built strong i think he's gone away from sort of like the lifting side of thing and only focuses on the animal uh, movement side of things yeah. but if you can combine the two and really get like that story of you know how they intertwine how they align with each other and really show like and, you know simple business show the success but make it fun make it inspiring i definitely think that there's something there especially me you know, being the broken man, knowing at the moment that this is stuff that I need to work on. But at the same sense, I've known it for 20 years and I just, just haven't done it because it bores the shit out of me. I know how important it is. It sounds horrible. I know how important it is. I've been a coach all my life, but I have just never prioritized it. Now I'm 44 and I'm really starting to notice how badly I'm falling apart. Like, yeah. this is the shit that I should have done 20 years ago, but no one presented it and in a way where I gave two shits about it. I think the last part of that's the biggest one. Because um, I think it's really easy for us to say that, like, oh, I wish I would have done this, like, 20 years ago. But, like, I don't know if, like, like 18-year-old Zach, who had just put on, like, 130 pounds in his back squat in four weeks by just, like, eating 60 eggs a week, sleeping 10 hours a day, and, like, going to the gym over winter break... Like, I don't know if he would have listened to me like, hey, you know what? Um, love this. You should also probably focus on this. But I think you're spot on. Like, you have to present this in a way that people are going to engage with it. Um, was on a walk this morning. I think, like, we are all in search of, like, the optimal plan. But I think that there are so many personal aspects of that. Like, intention in your workout is going to drive a better workout versus the optimal plan. I think Charles Paul can famously said, like, the most anabolic thing, among other things, um, is a good training partner in a great training environment. So I think like part of it is like how is like we as coaches like drive the intent, but also like position this stuff in a way where like maybe we lose a little bit of the effectiveness, but we increase the consistency that somebody does it. We increase their enjoyment of it. And like that's going to lead to a greater output long term. Um, I had something yesterday. So like Tim Ferriss was breaking down diets and he famously had like this low carb diet, which like I've done before and like it works really well. And when he's building a system or a framework, he broke it down to like adherence, effectiveness and efficiency, which I thought was like spot on for anything you do. So like, can somebody like stick to this for the long term? Because like the best plan laid out and not stuck to is like worthless. Like, is it effective? Like, does the product produce the result that we want? And then is it efficient? Is it a good use of your time and resources? I think like if you as a product owner, business owner, like coach 
can check the box on all those and do so in a way where you're maximizing those variables. Even if you leave a little bit on the table as far as quote unquote optimum, then I think you're going to reach more people and ultimately have a greater impact for that, which is, I think, what we want. We're getting towards the end here. I'm going to leave it with Brian for the for the last part here. But everyone listening to this, you're all building products. You're all thinking about product market fit and do people actually want what I have to offer? How do I get this message across? I've got this special source. How do I get someone to put it on their meal so that they can have you know the best meal ever? Uh, we're all thinking about that in some way. I'm, I'm challenging Kevin. Um, you can be really generic. Uh, you know, this is a conversation I'm having with Kevin. It's like you can be really generic and say, "Yeah, I help you know busy people lose five kilos in in ten weeks," and and everyone does that. And there's a certain amount of people that are going to buy that. It's like going to the girl at the bar and going, "Hey, you know, you 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 know, you want to meet a girl? You go to the bar and you go, "Hey, you want to fuck?" And if you ask enough people, someone is going to say yes, right? It's it's maybe one in one in a thousand, one in five hundred depends on the time of the night and which which place you're in, uh, and how big your wallet is, and uh, you know, well, all those factors. But uh, if you can improve the way that you speak to the to the ladies, then the percentages are going to change. And if you can actually have some some special abilities and something to offer, like you have a business and you dress well and you're intelligent and you speak multiple languages and then there's going to be a lot more ladies that are going to be interested in having a conversation with you. And the same goes for these businesses and how we can change the world. I personally think that natural patents is a, is a multi-million dollar business. I think your passion for natural patents, it's a multi-million dollar business waiting to happen. I've built multi-million dollar businesses. I've been a part of multiple million dollar businesses. And I do think that you have that, Brian, like with your movement, with your passion, with your knowledge, I see it there. What I think at the moment is a challenge is the market of people who want to trash gym training and do only this is kind of small. If you want to go at that path, then you go at like endurance runners and you go, hey, never go to the gym again and run better. That's a message that endurance runners want to hear. Or you go to soccer players and you go, hey, no more gym, only soccer. That's a message that soccer players want to hear. Mm. But for most people who are going to be potentially interested in buying your product, they're generally going to have trained before. And so if you start with, Hey, training's rubbish. This is the, this is the path. I'm, I'm generalizing, obviously it's going to be a more uphill battle of like, you really have to convince them that everything that's been done for the last hundred years is didn't work. And to, you know, to convince people that what LeBron James is doing didn't work. Like athletes are just going to be like, well, I don't care if, if LeBron James doesn't need it and he's the highest paid, you know, one of the highest paid athletes in history, one of the best athletes in history, if he doesn't do it, then I don't need to do it, you know? Uh, and so I think that the, the, the conversation here or the opportunity, if, if this was my business, if it was my family that was on the line, Brian, if, if I had to eat from your ticket, if I was going to get 20% of it, and that was my only hope, I would take this message to the market of people who like going to the gym. I'll take it to CrossFit. I'll take it to ATG. I'll take it to athletes. And I would say, if you put this in as your foundation layer, you're going to feel better when you train. You're going to have lower injuries. And it's not that difficult. It doesn't smash you up like other training methods do. You're going to feel younger. You're going to feel fresher. And you can put this in together with what you're doing. And and you're going to get phenomenal results. If you do want to leave your other stuff behind and focus only on this for a while, you might get better results sooner. Uh, And I believe that that message with, you know, the truth and the science and the, and the evolutionary data and all those things that you have, I think there's a very compelling case for it. And I don't think anyone's made that case in a compelling way yet, but there have been millions, millions of dollars of business generated in, uh, you know, this niche in a way. And it goes back to Feldenkrais and nobody owns it. Like there's a lot of different, um, and, and you know the history of it and you can speak to the history of it. And and I would love to see someone within Uncommon Success emerge. And if it's not Brian and someone else listens to this and they're like, yeah, I get this stuff as well. And I want to go take it to the world. Um, then, you know, let's talk. But honestly, Brian, like you've got, you know, you've got something really huge here. And to me, it's just this question of how can we language this and, and what battle do we want to fight? Um, that's going to make all the difference of, of whether this does become me not opportunity or whether it's, you know, a very, um, uh, it's a more difficult thing to, to take on the world. Um, and I, I, you know, to me, it's just not necessary to, 
to take on the whole training history and and take on LeBron James and stuff. It's a, it's a difficult case to make. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And I, I really appreciate the words as well. And, you know, um, yeah, this is important. And, and Zach, really uh, appreciate your words about it all as well. Um, but I think we're, we're circling the right thing. It's like, hey, guys, we need to create this base of movement. What you do on top of that, like enjoy, train hard, get explosive. It's like have fun. But this base of movement is going to let you do that longer. Um, there, there is guys within that who have been injured. Um, you know, uh, the the man who spoke before, Zach, sorry, sir, I forgot your name. Um, but, you know, he mentioned he's 44, picked up injuries, niggles. It's just like there's some guys it's just like, hey, those negative inputs, like you got to take them out for a while and, and, and build this natural pattern stuff a, a little bit bigger. So there, there's varying scales. But, you know, everyone's got to build this base. Natural you can pattern. tell – you can tell Liam, hey, like it's gonna, it's gonna take longer, or you might not get there if you if you keep doing CrossFit at the same time as doing this. I can't guarantee your success, but yeah. hey, what what happens if Liam does take this on and he and he does fifteen minutes of it every day and he keeps going to CrossFit? And what happens if that works? Like, is there some possibility that that actually does help him still? Because he, he just wants to feel all right. He doesn't. He's not looking to break the four hundred meter record in Mexico. Uh, you know, in his in his mm. master's division. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And the great thing is, it's just like once people understand, it, it, it really is about teaching. Once they understand these movement patterns, you put them in throughout your day. You're sitting at your laptop in Cesar, hips behind you, decompress through the belly and the chest. So that lifting that you do later in the day, it doesn't matter because you're walking well, you're sitting well, you're resting well, you, you're, you're decompressed, you're relaxed, you're in these natural patterns. That time that you go lift, it, it doesn't matter. Or it doesn't have as such a negative input, but yeah, love it. Who who prefers hearing that message to hey, you have to stop lifting so that you can not You're a woda. age badly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that that message of hey, you can work in a different posture. That's people are interested in that. Like, could that be your ebook? Could that be the entry in? You know, and it, I'm not saying don't get full converts in the future. You can have full converts in the future that hate barbells and that whatever. Um, but I wouldn't start with betting on that's what everyone's going to be. Maybe Zach, you want to you share something here? I'll, I'm, I'm done for for this message. Yeah, I think to, to wrap it up is just kind of a, to tie the bow in both of those. I would dominate a very small market and scale up from there. I would not try to worry about like be the hero in that, uh, and then you can expand. And I think I would do so in a way that is as easy to integrate into their life without upheaving everything else, like. When I look at this, and we can talk more about the Telegram offline, the warm up or something around that, where like you're attaching this to something they already do, um, would be a really good way to do that. I think the warm up may be a great place to start because, like, if they do this and they perform better in their workout, and there's a performance aspect tied to that, then they're going to start attributing the greater success in the workout to this. And then they're going to say, hey, what if we go down this natural patterns like pathway a bit more? And you kind of give them a bit of a taste enough. They realize they like it or they don't like it. And then they go from there. So I think like, who are the, like, where do you want to stack this in, in a natural point that somebody's already doing um, where it's very easy for them to integrate that. And then number two is like, what sliver of the market can you go after to build your success stories around to then expand out? And then three is exactly like the point that I think all of us hit on is doing this in a way that is very inclusive and you're not telling people that like you have to give up everything you've ever known and loved to do this or else you're going to have like, I think go to said like knee cancer or something like weird like that. Um, so like, I, I think those three things, like find your sliver of the market, figure out where to integrate this in a place that is low friction, easy to adopt. And then number three, like grow the brand in a way where you're saying something different, you're speaking truth and catching attention, but you're not isolating the majority of the world when you do it. Love that. Love that. Yeah. That, yeah. Love that. A lot more inarguable. As soon as you provide that like resistance, someone's already against you. As soon as you opened your mouth. Love that. Yeah. Zach, thank you. I think Keegan's going to wrap up, but yeah, thank you. And you know, everyone else who's on here, it's just awesome. I, yeah. I think this is a, this is a great conversation. I think, I think it's an important conversation and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad we we're able to have it. I really like the way that you, you took this on. I'm glad that Zach was able to just jump in. I messaged him to see if he was around. Um, 
yeah, Brian, like no, no one's arguing with the fundamentals of what you're talking about there, the science. And it's just the question of that, that messaging. And I think if we can maintain curiosity of what the world's best training system looks like, I think we, we need to maintain that curiosity of like, what else, you know, what else can we do? What else makes this better? And, and continue to do that with, with each of our businesses, with each of our training systems and practices, um, then, then, you know, eventually we get to, to better things. There's definitely something in this, in this realm, you know, it's a lot. Uh, so we need to have this conversation. The best way to have this conversation is, um, you know, to, to be able to discuss it with someone who is still trains another method and to be able to discuss, you know, to tell, to tell someone that they're everything they've ever done or how they put on a lot of muscle mass wasn't the, the, the path and such. Um, yeah, it's going to create that conflict. So hmm. ultimately, you know, Brian, like, thanks for sharing that there's something here. I think everyone, I think most people in Uncommon Success, when Zach's talking about find a, find someone to start with, I think if you have something clear that you want to share with Uncommon Success, I'm, I'm guaranteed you're going to find 10, 20, 50 people who are willing to experience that experiment with it. Yeah, Jonas has put his hand up. You know, Liam's already put his hand up. If the conversation is, hey, let's put this in with some of the things that you're doing, every, you know, there's got to be a lot of hands going up. If it's you have to stop everything that you like, then not mm. everyone's going to put their, you know, there's there's not everyone's going to want to do that. It's, it's a big, big decision, and and they maybe don't have big enough goals to to justify that. So, um, mm. thank you so much for being open to the to the conversation discussion. Thank you for bringing new knowledge, you know, to the network, and and I love that we're able to talk on a business level as well as you know, about the the training system. I think we should revisit this. It'd be great to do this maximum a quarter from now and see what's happened with, with natural patterns. Like the follow-up is the is where the fun is. Um, we're all on your team. We want to see this work. We want to see this get out. We want to see you express and and test it. And that's ultimately the, what the test is going to be. Let's get a thousand people through the system and then we're gonna we're gonna know the data is going to be there. Um so yeah thank you. Thank you Zach. Thanks everyone for for jumping in and contributing. And uh, yeah, have an amazing rest of the day. If anyone wants to say goodbye, welcome to unmute and do that. And then we'll, we'll speak again soon. Love it. Thank you, Keegan. Champion. Take it easy, y'all. See you, team.